Welcome back to one of my small Haskell screencasts. In the last one, we looked at the list of prime numbers that we've defined using an interesting sieve algorithm. And indeed, we had one list that contained all the prime numbers, even though there are infinite uh, number of them. And that works because Haskell is a lazy language, which means the data structure is only being created as we use it. And since we can only ever use a finite amount of the data structure, um, we can conceptually have infinite data structure. But actually, there are two different kind of infinite lists in Haskell you can encounter. And today we're going to look at that. But let's get started with uh, simple finite lists. So I'm going to use this setup here on the left is my editor. On the right, I'm going to start um, the interpreter. And let's define a, a finite list for, let's say, one, two, all the way up to six. Uh, if I look at that, I don't have to reload. If I look at that, okay, there's the finite number of lists, uh, um, the finite list. And I can look at how this list looks like in memory. I use the tool ghgvis, which gives me um, the ability to look at this list as it looks in memory. And here we can see the structure of a list in Haskell. So um, you can ignore this uh, little thing here. It's uh, a const cell, it's the colon. You recognize that as prepending an element to a list. And then this object in memory has two pointers, one for the element at the position. So we start with the one, the i hash means it's an integer. And then the second element of the constructor, the second argument is the remainder of the list. And, therefore, and then again, we find another one of these const cells all the way until the end when we have the empty list. And again, you can ignore this big number. This is an artifact of how we read the memory in a rather um, obscure way here. So this is what a list looks like in memory when it's fully evaluated. But actually, it's more interesting to see it being evaluated. So let's clear the, the view. Let's reload. Like maybe I have to recompile. Let me see if I can trigger recompilation. And now let's look at nums again. Ah, that's better. So now it is a thunk. A thunk is an unevaluated expression. So this is the thing that sits there in place of the value that you've defined until you've used for the first time. And let's say I use the list now a little bit. Let's say I want to know what is the what are the first two elements of the list. Okay, it's one and two. That's, that's expected. Now, what does the memory look like now? We can say update. And now we see that the list has been evaluated by two elements, but not further. This is still a thunk. And if I now look at the next next element and update the view, then it goes on. Uh, I can actually click on this thunk here on the left in this view and drive the evaluation there. And this goes on until we've evaluated the last element and then we're done. So this is a finite list, but you can already guess what it happens when you define an infinite list. So let's remove the upper bound here and uh, reload and clear the view and view the nums. Okay, it looks like before, it's a thunk. And we can click on that, or we can also look at the first elements um, here and update the view. And it looks like before. We keep getting new elements and the, and, and the remainder is a thunk. The only difference is now that it'll never stop. As long as I click on this thunk, I'll get a new element. And this is an infinite list. But it's still rather large. This list um, will fill up my memory if I try to find the end, because there is no end. But there are different lists as well. And for that, let's use this function called cycle that Haskell provides. It takes a list and returns a list, and we can, um, if I say cycle, hello, it'll just keep repeating hello and hello after um, uh, without end. So let's let's um, define a finite list again and then say take the um, cycle of that. So I clear, I reload and now I view the nums thunk and I view the cycling of nums. So what happens here now? Well, we can start looking a little bit down the nums 
And we see that same thing as before, one, two, three, and so on. So what happens if I look at the first element of the cycle of num? So it should be the one. So we should expect to find a cons cell that points to the one. So we find that. It's very parallel. That's nice. But then we find that the, con the continuation here is another func, and that has two pointers. So one is down to the next element of the list, which is expected because that's what it needs to look at when we ask for the next element. Okay, now it gets more confusing and swap the sides. So I don't have control over that bit. Um, but then there's another pointer in this thunk, another thing it refers to, um, and that's the original list. Or not the original list, but rather the, um, the list that we're defining. So let's look at the next element in the list. So for that, I have to click here. And notice that as I'm looking at the third element of the cycling of nums, I will also force the third element of the original list of nums because that's what we need to get this. So clicking this thunk will also evaluate this thunk. So let's see what happens. Okay, so we have now the next element in the original list. We have the next element in the cycle of the list. And this still points up. So let's go to the end of this list. Okay, and now we can go down here. So now the next element should be the five. And what should be the tail of that list? Well, it should start with one again. So let's try that. Ah, oh no, it's still a funk. Okay, We've, we found the five, fifth element. Now the sixth element of the cycling of the list, that should be again the one. So let's see what happens if we click here. Okay, what has happened? Now, the remainder of the list after the, the fifth element here is appointed to the beginning of the list. And now you can see how that is an infinite data structure because if you just follow down the pointers of the list and you look for the next element, the next element, and so on, well, you will never come to an end. But it's also different than the list that we saw, that we saw because this one is already fully evaluated. There's no more thunks around, which means I can traverse this list without end and it will never fill up my memory, it will never stop. If I, if I say something like um, map print cn, and this will just happily keep working. And it just runs in circles around this list that we see here. So it looks at one, two, three, four, five, and so on, and comes back. So the question now is this function cycles, cycle. Is that special or can we define it ourselves? Well, let's try it. Let's try to find a different function called cycle. We know its type is going to be a to a and it takes a list. So now it starts with this list and then after that list, we want to continue with, well, start again. So we can just say, cycle prime of access. So let's see if that works. I clear the screen, I reload, and then I look at the nums. And let's actually evaluate it. Okay. And now I look at the cycle nums. Start with a thunk, that's nice. So this looks similar to before. So here we have, let me maybe evaluate a few more elements so that it's, it doesn't really give us a nice graph shape. So we have to look carefully. So the, the nums begins here, the cycle nums is up here. It looks different than before, so something is strange. And we see, okay, it's uh, the one, the two, the three, and then the continuation refers to um, the next element that we need to look for from the original list and via another thunk, the original list that we started with. And that may not quite work out. So let's see, we keep looking at this. So now we have four, now we have the five. The next element is here. And at this point in the previous code, we, we had the cycle. But now we actually have, um, oh, now there's, th now there's another element, a new one that refers to the one. And if you keep going, and actually let's do this here. Let's take 12 
from cycle. So we it cycles just right. The, the code is correct. It, it does the right output. But here we really see it's filling up the memory. And um, the graph optimization here doesn't look very nice. But what we can maybe see is that this is a, a long list of con cells and it's pointing to the same elements of the, as the written list. But we still are creating new uh, list const constructors all over the place. And if we, if I were to say um, this map and print, I mean, it's still printing these things, but now it's filling up my memory because now every time it's printing something, it's creating a new console. And because we're referring to this value here in our interpreter, and we can still play around with it, it doesn't even get garbage collected. So now I'm really filling up the memory, which I don't, don't want to. So let me uh, stop that. So did the original definition do something wrong, uh, something magic that we can't do with normal Haskell? No, it didn't. Just have to be careful about where we create new things and where we refer to existing things. So this cycle prime here, that is, it's kind of the same as, as, as this thing here, right? I mean, that's by definition, it's the same thing. So I think what we want to say here is that cycling the XS list should print this, this list or produce that list. And then if I produce that list from here to here, maybe, or I guess for you, it's from here to here. And then it should point to the beginning again. I mean, that's what we saw in the GHEVIS. So we somehow have to give that thing a name and put it at the end of the thing we're defining. Can we do that? Well, it turns out we can. So if we call this R for result, and we say the result of this function is XS followed by the result, because we, we want to use the result inside the result. And then we return that result. And with that definition, let's look at the nums. Um, let's view the nums. Let's view the cycling of nums. And now, we see that it looks a little bit different than the compiled one. Um, so let's see what happens at the end. Okay, now we have we have the parallel structure. So we've copied the first five elements of the list. And if you now click here, ah, we get the circle again. So now it's referring to itself again. There's nothing we can evaluate. It's fully evaluated. We've put an infinite list, um, fully evaluated into a finite amount of memory. Is that useful? Well, there are certain idioms like zipping with another list where this is kind of a useful data structure. You don't find it everyday Haskell use, but it's still good to know how things look like in memory, depending on how you create them. By the way, if you like, want to have this code a bit more pretty, you can of course also use the where clause and then it really looks like a fancy declarative mathematical definition and does the same thing. So with that, I would stop for now. There is something interesting about these infinite data structures in the sense that they are fragile. You can easily break them if you use them in different ways. And I think I will tell you more about that the next time. Thank you and let me know if you have any concerns, wishes, suggestions, or I'm also happy to take breaks.